Welcome to Obsolete, the show where old technology goes to live. I'm Famicoman, and this is episode 8. I know, I know, it's a little bit delayed, but better late than never. And at the end of the episode, I'm going to be having an announcement for what's going to happen in future episodes, so get ready for that. But um, without further ado, we're going to go on to the first segment, which is 8-track tapes. So, 8-track tapes. You've probably seen them in thrift stores, or you might have had a couple. They were originally called Learjet Stereo 8. They were introduced in 1964, and they were popular to the late 70s. They're quarter-inch tape, which is similar to reel-to-reel, -reel, except that these play in an endless loop, so when you get to the end of the tape, it starts back over again from the beginning. They're not the perfect technology, they're prone to jamming and head misalignment, the tape also deteriorates. Uh, they actually coexisted with cassettes for a while, and then uh, cassettes eventually took off. So they replaced 4-track tapes, and they are called 8-track tapes because they have 4 programs, each with 2 channels. So there are actually 8 tracks of audio recorded on the tape, which technically play simultaneously. Now the way that the player works is that it aligns the reading head so that it only gets two channels at a time. So whenever the tape ends and goes back to the beginning, the head adjusts and then plays another of the two channels. So as I said, the tapes have uh, four programs. Each program usually has two, three songs on it, so you can fit a whole album on it, generally. and. Uh, going to show you one right now. Here's a tape that I got that was uh, smashed up pretty badly. And if you open it up, you can see here that we have the rollers and then the tape itself. And uh, it has one end of the tape coming from the outside while the other is on the inside. So tape gets rolled, gets played, and then returns back. And now usually one of the problems they have is, probably can't find it here, but there's a splice in here somewhere where the ends of the tape come together, and those break all the time, and then usually the tape would be wound in the tape. Tape's no good anymore. So. Now in front of us here we have a 8-track recorder system made by Sears. I have a couple of 8-track players. This is the only one that I have that is an actual recorder. So we have the recorder, and I've gone ahead and hooked it up to some cone speakers, which are pretty cool all in themselves. But uh, now I'm going to show you how earlier I have my uh, iPod here, and I recorded some music onto one of these. Now this is a recordable 8-track tape. I only have a couple of these, and actually came with the recorder and I've never seen another one so recorded some music onto it earlier and now I'm gonna play it so you can see how it sounds Okay, so it's not the most crisp sound, but it does have an interesting texture to the sound, I guess you could say. A lot of bands out there actually use 8-trap as a, sort of an experimental format. They'll record to it, and then they'll pull their music off of the tapes themselves, and uh, it just alters the sound in a way that's pretty much undefinable by anything that we have out currently. And 8-tracks um, are, I guess you could consider them pretty much dead. There are actually bands out there that still release in 8-track tape. I think that there's still maybe one or two very small companies that will produce a run of 8-track tapes. And I believe uh, a couple years ago Cheap Trick actually released their new album on 8-track and sent them to radio stations and it created kind of a buzz. So 8-track's um, a pretty cool format. I probably have maybe 75 tapes and they're really starting to break down but they're also really cool. I mean, how many P 
people out there can tell you that they have a Beatles album on 8-track. And everybody's focusing on vinyl and everybody, you know, still loves using CDs and we have digital audio now. But 8-tracks are just kind of one of the cool little forgotten pieces of technology and uh, they're actually pretty fun once you work through all the obvious problems with them. I hope you enjoyed that segment, and now we're going to get into some reviews. So, over the summer I read a ton of books, but two that really stand out are Kingpin by Kevin Paulson and Ghost in the Wires by Kevin Mitnick. Now I'm going to go into these books a little bit. Uh, Ghost in the Wires is Kevin Mitnick's whole life story, you could say. It's from his first toyings with computers up until his bust. And you not only get to see, you know, what you've heard in documentaries like Freedom Downtime or what you've seen in the news, you get the whole story from his point of view. And it's actually really interesting to see how he goes back and forth with the authorities and just how he can, I guess, break into things. I mean, he's really good at social engineering, you can tell from the book. And uh, he even goes into some of his techniques. And it's a real fascinating look at everything that he's done. Um, it's a pretty quick read, I would say. Uh, it probably took me maybe five, six days. I would definitely check it out. It's really good. And um, not detracting anything from Kingpin. Kingpin's by Kevin Polson. It's not a book about him, though. It's about this uh, hacker named Max Butler, who is probably relatively unknown. But um, the story follows him through credit card fraud. Now, you get to see him as a teenager and how he's you know, sort of the misfit kid, I guess you could say, and he turns to this life of crime. And it's it's really interesting to see how, on one hand, he has all of these interesting activities that he does. He lives in this house with a bunch of his friends, and it's, it's you know, it sounds like paradise. It's a programming house. Everybody's working on projects. It's really cool. And then he starts to take, you know, some tumbles with the authorities, and he gets deeper and deeper into this life of credit card fraud. And it's really interesting to see how all of these, I guess you could say, underground websites operate and uh, just everything involved with it. And it's a really fun story. There's a, there's a lot of intricate details and uh, I don't want to ruin it too much for you, but I would definitely check it out. Uh, it is also a pretty quick read, I'd say. Probably like four days for this one. I mean, it's, it's you can see the thicknesses here. It's, it's about I don't know, two-thirds, half the size of Ghost in the Wire. So, it, you'll have no problem finishing them. I say get both of them. Great books. Definitely the probably the best cybercrime books that came out over the summer. And they're from pretty cool people. So not only do you get to see, you know, hacking from the point of view of these famous hackers and freakers, you get to see their writing, which is pretty interesting. So, hope you enjoyed this review, and uh, now we're going to get into the final segment, which is flexi discs. So today I'm going to show you some flexi discs. Um, they're also called sound sheets, and I've heard them referred to as flexies for short. Uh, they came out in 1960. Usually they were included in magazines as a sort of uh, disposable music format, something that could be cheaply produced and uh, played on any turntable. And uh, they got really popular from uh, 1963 when uh, the Beatles fan club started sending them out during Christmas. And they did so until 1969. And that saw a huge surge in popularity of flexi discs. Um, also interesting to note is that during wartime in Russia, when materials are low, they actually produced flexi discs using uh, discarded x rays from hospitals. So it wouldn't be too uncommon for you to get your underground bootleg record and have it be like an x-ray of some guy's leg. So it's, it's really interesting and those flexi discs are still out there. So you can look up some pictures of those. They're actually pretty cool. So um, before I actually show you the discs, I'm going to start out here. I have a 45 RPM record. Now, as you can see, you got grooves on both sides. It's pretty firm. It's your typical record. So right here it's actually 
a flexi disc. Now this one I believe is Italian. You can see it's very flexible. There's grooves on this side, but on the other side there's just some information about the disc. Now here's a more modern flexi disc. If I zoom in here you can see it says Joyful Noise 2012 flexi disc series. Now Joyful Noise is a modern company which has been producing flexi discs and they have a, a subscription right now where once a month they will send you a flexi disc with a new unreleased song. So they are currently making flexi discs, which is kind of cool. Now if I pull it out here, you can see that this one is actually a square when compared to the last one. It's just one solid piece of plastic and it's transparent kind of cool but um, you can see there's grooves on this side and like the other disc this side is just completely flat so it's only meant for one-sided play and uh, now I'm gonna show you what the sound quality of these is and I'm gonna play them for you on a turntable alright so here I have a normal turntable now let's take the older flexi disc and see how it sounds Now something I noticed that was kind of strange about this one is that it's a uh, 33 RPM. So let's move it to 33. Alright, as you can see, that one's uh, a little scratchy. I mean, it's old, so let's let's see how it sounds with a newer Flexi. Put on the Joyful Noise one. And this one runs on 45, so... So as you can see, that one sounds a lot better. So this has been Flexi Discs. They're pretty cool. They're still making them. Maybe they're making a comeback. And uh, I find them a heck of a lot of fun. Hopefully you do too. Well, that's everything from this episode of Obsolete. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find all of the show notes and all the download links at the website. Uh, you can follow me at my website. Um, if you're interested in any of the music in this episode, you can check out Moonlit's website for uh, Bike Garden. And um, besides all of that, there's uh, some projects that came about over the summer. Um, first one is Tech Tat, which you can check out. It's sort of an online, I guess you could say, museum for vintage technology or even some current technology on there. So you can check that out. You can contribute if you want. Um, we also have our own online television station now, which is called uh, Channel EM, or Channel M, however you want to pronounce it, really up to you. Um, so we have a bunch of documentaries, uh, other IPTV shows, and uh, we're looking to expand. So if you happen to run a show, or if you know of any shows that probably fit in with the other types of content that we have on there, drop us a line, you can check us out. Um, and I also just want to bring back uh, the IPTV archive, which it's, it's been a little stale lately, I guess you could say, but I've recently gone and taken all of the content there and put it on archive.org. So now, if anything ever happens to blip or anything, or if you just really want those original files that haven't been blipified, I guess you could say, and are all in this giant RSS feed, you can download all the original files. And this leads way to another project, which I'm not announcing yet, but there's going to be a lot of videos up, so I'll just let you guys know. And uh, before I leave you here, I said there's going to be an announcement, and there's a big one. So, Obsolete Season 2. I recently got new camera. Ooh. This is the uh, Canon EOS Rebel T3i. 
also known as the 600D, and this is a uh, DSLR, and it is HD capable, so this show is eventually going to be in HD for the second season. Does it really need HD? Probably not, but it'll make everything look a lot more pretty, because uh, what I'm shooting with now only has digital zoom, and it's, it, it's getting kind of antiquated for... I guess most things, even though this is a show about old technology, it's it, it it's nice to have nice things to look at sometimes. So um, I'm not gonna jump into season two really quickly. I need to uh, I need some time to play around with this. I only got this a couple days ago, so I'm gonna be shooting some test videos. I'm gonna be working on lighting. I'm gonna be working on editing. Just trying to revitalize everything. So um, pay attention to the show site. Pay attention to my site and uh, probably the, the Vimeo account, because I'm going to be uploading some test videos, anything I do. So, uh, yeah, you can look forward to Season 2. So, that is it for this episode, really. And I uh, hope to see you guys all again soon in Season 2. So you're going to stay, right? Oh, you bet. Remember, the plan said that merchandising kit has to be up tomorrow morning, first thing. Not a problem. And Bob, this time we really have to go by the book. <laughs> <laughs>